So the first live revision class is going to be really small. Obviously, we'll start from the topic cost of capital. And the whole objective of conducting live revision classes is all the topics, each and every topic which we have in AFM, Advanced Financial Management, we will revise each and every topic through these live revision classes. Within 14 to 15 classes, inshallah, we are going to complete the entire course. But let me explain. These will be just live revision classes. Obviously, the main course is your pre-recorded course where we have covered each and everything. But these 14 to 15 classes in which we are going to cover the entire uh, advanced financial management course, this will also serve the purpose of smart revision as well. In addition to that, obviously, these live revision classes will give you the opportunity to ask the question during the class, obviously relating to the topic. And I think admin has already informed the topic that is cost of capital. So number one, <clears throat> before the class, now from here onwards, at least three to four days before the class, admin is going to send the message in your relevant WhatsApp groups topic will also be shared with you so that you should know in advance uh, what topic we are going to discuss. And one important point, please uh, try to watch lectures as soon as possible. Because as earlier you can complete all the lectures, automatically you will have more time for the practice. So let's start. And let me, anything else, if you want to ask, you can ask before we start the class. Your teacher is available. Just a minute. <clears throat> okay. Let me share the page. Yes. Okay. Okay, it's a first live revision class uh, for September 2024. Uh, what should be the strategy to cover the course of September at them considering a working individual? I think, yes, sir, uh, you should be having a planner because as soon as any uh, student joins any of our course, admin does, admin, obviously they do share the planner. No, 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 no. What you need to read and what you are not supposed to read, each and everything is already included in the lectures. Don't worry at all. So you people just focus on lectures. Each and everything is there. Articles, what you need to learn, what you need to memorize, everything is there. Don't worry at all. Just do one thing. Try to complete lectures as soon as possible. So, AFM. September 2024 attempt. Obviously, it's the first live revision class topic cost of capital obviously today's class is not going to be a very long class but slowly and gradually obviously the time period of the class will increase okay cost of capital the first thing relating to the cost of capital regarding to the cost of capital which you should know that if somebody asks you, what is the objective of cost of capital? The objective is investment appraisal. Objective of cost of capital is investment appraisal. Because if you're not doing investment appraisal, then there's no need to find out cost of capital. So the objective of cost of capital is investment appraisal. And everybody should know that investment appraisal is a long-term decision. 
Investment appraisal is a long term decision. Now, very important point I want to highlight here. What is the objective of cost of capital? Investment appraisal. And I said investment appraisal is a long term decision. Now, listen carefully what I want to say right now. That is why while calculating cost of capital, we do not consider bank overdraft because bank OD is a short term source of finance. So since bank OD is a short term source of finance, we don't take that into while calculating cost of capital. Why don't we consider OD? Because the objective of cost of capital is investment appraisal. We are going to use this cost of capital in investment appraisal. And I said, investment appraisal is a long-term decision. So this is the reason why we don't consider bank overdraft while calculating cost of capital. Okay, now the second point. Actually, what do you mean by cost of capital? So we say actually cost of capital represents cost of financing. Obviously, when you are going to make investment in any project, you have to raise the finance and nobody gives the finance in free. Each one of source of finance is having their own cost. So basically, Cost of capital, it represents, it shows cost of financing. What it shows, it shows cost of financing. So we have discussed the objective and while discussing the objective, I have given the reason why don't we take bank OD in cost of capital. And the meaning of cost of capital is just it shows it represents cost of financing. Please, again, it's a short term source of finance. We never take line of credit as well. Short term sources of finance are not considered. If the bank has told me whenever you need XYZ amount, you can take this much line of credit. We never take it. I have another question. Malik, have you ever seen in any cost of capital examiner has given you the line of credit? So simple. So only we consider long-term sources of finance. Okay, now. When we say cost of capital, Okay, I have another question. Uh, do you know, what, what do you mean by angel investors? When a new business is just starting at that time, they are going to make in friend. So obviously, again, it's a question. Have you seen this in your any cost of capital question? Ali, have you seen this in any... AFM cost of capital goes. So please, let's stay stick to the topic. Cost of capital. Cost of capital. When we say in order to make an investment an organization is going to raise the finance. So what are the sources of finance which are available to an entity? An organization can raise the finance in the form of equity. When a company raises the finance in the form of equity, then company will have to bear the cost. The cost is KE, cost of equity. Second, Company can raise the finance in the form of debt, loan, 
if an entity raises the finance in the form of debt, then the cost is KD, 1 minus T. Costs of debt after tax. Why cost of debt after tax is the cost for the company? Because on loan, company will have to pay fixed interest and fixed interest payment results in tax saving. That is why in case of debt, we don't say the cost is KD. We say the cost is KD 1 minus T. Cost of debt after tax. Because when entity pays interest, interest payments, they result in tax saving. That is why KD 1 minus T. But you will not get K KE 1 minus T because uh, entity is going to provide dividend to the shareholders. And dividend comes after tax. It does not come before tax. Payment of dividend does not save any tax. That is where the KE only. But payment of interest saves tax. That is why KD 1 minus T. Third and last is the preference shares, which I have never ever seen in AFM, but obviously you should know that. Preference shares. An entity can raise the finance in the form of preference shares. If an entity raises the finance in the form of preference shares, the cost is KP. Cost of preference shares. And we will discuss, which again, I've never seen in uh, AFM, but I've seen in some other papers. They are where the topic is, again, the cost of capital. That is... Actually, when we say preference shares, so there is possibility of two preference shares. One is redeemable, another is irredeemable. So there are two possibilities in case of preference shares. One is irredeemable, another is redeemable. Uh, nothing is mentioned, then preference shares are always assumed as irredeemable preference shares. If examiner has given you the redeemable preference shares, then it has to be mentioned in the question. If the shares are redeemable, how do we calculate KP? Obviously, we'll discuss. Just wait for that. And if the shares are irredeemable, how do we dis calculate KP? We'll discuss that also. But just let me give you a quick idea. If the shares are redeemable, then cost of preference share is calculated by using IRR. So if someone asks you a question that preference shares are redeemable, how will you calculate KP? Yes, we can calculate KP, uh, but this time I have to use IRR. How we'll use IR, we'll see that. But obviously, I would say almost 100%, you will have irredeemable preference shares. In case of irredeemable preference shares, we know the formula. That is KP is equal to D0 upon P0 into 100. Okay, now let us first discuss K. How do we calculate K? Basically, to calculate K, there are two possible models. There are two models available to calculate KE. One is capital asset pricing model, CAPM. Another is dividend valuation model, or you can say dividend growth model. So to calculate cost of equity, we there are two models in our slavers. One is CAPM, capital asset pricing model. The second is dividend valuation model. Another name is dividend growth model. Now, a very important point is when we say CAPM, capital asset pricing model, simply the KE is equal to RF plus RM minus RF into equity beta. Now, listen, KE. K is basically cost of equity. K is the cost of equity. Now you need to under develop one understanding that is 
the same thing, which is cost for one entity is going to be returned for someone else. For example, if APLC is taking the loan from the bank, obviously APLC is paying interest to the bank and it is a cost for the APLC. But the same thing is written for the bank. It means someone can write instead of cost of equity, you can also write the minimum return required by the shareholders. Another name for the cost of equity is minimum return. Required by the shareholders. Yes, I know that. I know that. I know that. Because it is not in the slavers. That is why. It is not in the slavers. Just for the sake of knowledge, I have written here. It is not in your book as well. Okay, KE. <clears throat> cost of equity slash minimum return required by the shareholders. RF. Simply risk free. Rate of return. Risk-free rate of return is simply return on government bonds. The return on government bond is taken as risk-free rate of return. RM? Average return on a stock exchange. Average return on a stock exchange. Equity beta? Simply before developing any understanding of equity beta, we should know the meaning of beta. Can you give me a minute? Just a minute. Oh, my student is contacting. Only beta. Can you say beta is a measure of risk? And we have two types of risk. Systematic and unsystematic. Unsystematic risk is a diversifiable risk. Unsystematic risk is a diversifiable risk. This is the risk which you can spread, reduce, even eliminate. For example, instead of making the entire investment in only one organization's shares, if you make investment in number of organization's shares, so automatically your risk will diversify. I always give one example. Let me bring it here. For example, if you have, let's say, 1 million. If you invest entire 1 million in one organization's shares, then obviously we'll say that you have not diversified, you are not having a diversified portfolio of investment. If you invest the entire 1 million in one organization's shares, which means that if the share price of that company increases, your 100% investment will increase. If the share price of that organization reduces, then 100% of your investment will reduce. Instead of that, if you divide this by 20, you will get 50,000. And this 50,000 is obviously 5% of the entire amount. So instead of making the entire investment in one organization's shares, if you invest in 20 different organizations in different industries, and in each company, let's say you have invested only 50,000, means 5% of your total investment. 
The benefit is even the one organization's share price reduces, still there are going to be 95% chances that you will get a benefit. Even the two organizations share prices reduces, still there will be a 90% chance you will get the benefit. It means you have a diversified portfolio of investment now. According to CAPM, obviously in capital asset pricing model, there are a number of assumptions. One of them is investor is having a well diversified portfolio of investment that is why CAPM assumes that CAPM assumes that unsystematic risk is zero. Why it is zero? Because of the assumption. And let me repeat the assumption. Capital asset pricing model assumes that investor is having a well diversified portfolio of investment. That is why unsystematic risk is zero. Now we have to work according to this assumption. Just for the sake of your knowledge, I just want to give you one question answer. That is, if someone asks you a question, it is not necessary that every investor is going to have a very diversified portfolio of investment. And that is true. Then practically what should be done, then practically instead of capital asset pricing model, we go towards portfolio theory. The benefit of using portfolio theory is for those investors, they don't have well diversified portfolio of investment. Instead of CAPM, they use portfolio theory. The benefit of the portfolio theory is actually the portfolio theory considers both the risk, systematic as well as unsystematic. But obviously the, the entire portfolio theory, two asset portfolio theory and other portfolio theories, they are not in your AFM slavers. So obviously we're not going towards that. Now, we are left with systematic risk. Systematic risk is not a diversifiable risk. Not a diversifiable risk. Means you cannot do anything. For example, if in your country, the government increases the interest rate and it affects your business badly, you can't do anything. If inflation rate increases in your country, you at least in that country, you can't do anything. Obviously, if the interest rate increases and it is affecting badly on your project, it has a bad impact on your project, you can't do anything. For example, let's say you have made an investment in a project and you are making a product which is so expensive, which is so expensive that normally whoever wants to buy that product, that individual, let's say, needs financing. After one year or two years, if the government has increased the interest rate, so obviously now people will not be willing to take loan to buy your product because of high interest rate. You cannot do anything. So systematic risk is not a diversifiable risk. Examples are increase in the tax rate, increase in the interest rate, uh, devaluation of your currency. These are the things. It means it's a systematic risk is not a diversifiable risk. Now, when we say equity beta, that is basically equity beta or beta equity, whatever you say. Actually, beta equity obviously is a measure of risk, but definitely it measures only which risk? Systematic risk. Why? Because in capital asset pricing model, we have already decided that unsystematic is, is zero because of the assumption. So beta equity is a measure of systematic risk. Is a measure of systematic risk. Which indicates that How your investment will respond to the changes in a stock index.
simply if this stock index increases by i always give one example if the stock index increases by 2% and your investment increases by 4% if you are if you are if your investment gives you the return higher than the market then it means it's a riskier investment because in the event of loss you will be having a loss more than the market but the main thing which main thing is which you should know that is Equity beta is a measure of systematic risk, which indicates that how your investment will respond to the changes in a stock index. Now, the last thing is RM minus RF. It is actually equity risk premium. The name of RM minus RM is RF is equity risk premium. Why equity? Because if you are buying the shares of any company, you will become equity holder. Why risk? Obviously, after making an investment in XYZ company's shares, you will face risk. Why premium means uh, more than something. Obviously, without taking any risk, you can get the return of RF. If you're making investment at a stock exchange, you are facing risk. So obviously, you will be expecting at least you will be having in your mind that I should be getting a return more than RF. That is why premium, equity risk premium. Another name for the same thing is market risk premium. Market risk premium. Okay. Now I really want every one of you to quickly solve this very simple question. The main thing is Instead of numerics, I'll be more interested to explain the interpretation. Let's say beta equity is zero, beta equity is 0 0.8, beta equity is one, beta equity is let's say 1.85. I need four different keys. Please, I really want every one of you quickly solve it. Let's just start. The number one is beta equity zero. K is equal to RF, which is 7%. RM is 15 minus 7 and the beta equity is zero. So K is equal to 7%. Now listen, number one. The first finding is if your equity beta is zero, it means you have made an investment which does not have any risk. So risk-free investment is only one that is the investment in government bond. Can I say if we are not facing any risk, then the KE is going to be equal to RF. The first finding, I hope it should be clear to everyone. First finding is clear to everyone. Please comment on that one by one. So that, okay, first one is clear to everyone. Now let's go to the second one. Second one, please. In the second one, listen. When the beta equity is less than one, when the beta equity is less than one, the interpretation of beta equity less than one is your investment is less riskier than the market. Can I say when my investment is less riskier than the market, then I'm going to demand the return lower than the market. So in that case, logically the key is going to be lower than RM. Let's apply. K is equal to 7% plus 15 minus 7 into 0 0.8. Whatever answer comes, then with that answer, I'm going to just write the percentage sign. So can anyone tell us what is the answer, please? Because right now, the, I don't have a calculator in front of me. So what is the answer? See, uh, if it is coming 0 0.13, 0 0.134, with, multiply that with 100, you will get 13.4%. Okay, third. If beta equity is 1, now listen. Beta equity is equal to 1 is a benchmark beta. Beta equity is equal to 1 is a benchmark beta. 
and this benchmark beta means systematic risk of your investment is equal to the systematic risk of market. Can I say if it is a benchmark beta and my investment is facing the same risk which is in the market, so I'm going to demand the return which is equal to the market. So in case of beta equity is equal to 1, Ke is going to be equal to Rm. Let's see. 7 plus 15 minus 7 into 1. Logically, 7 with this 7 will be cancelled out. Or it's up to you, 15 minus 7 becomes 8. Can I say Ke is equal to 15%? Yes or no? Fourth and the last one. If beta equity is more than equity beta is more than one, if equity beta is more than one, it means your investment is more riskier than the market. Excellent. Your investment is more riskier than the market. If my investment is more riskier than the market, I'm going to demand the return higher than the market. Case four. So let's see. K is equal to. 7 plus 15 minus 7 into it was uh, 1.85. Please, what are we getting? 21 point. Some of the students, they have shared the answer. 21.8% students, everyone is having the same answer. Okay. Okay, students. So I just, uh, it's the first class I, at the start of the class I did mention is going to be a very small class. I really want you to know how many lectures each one of you have seen. Uh, you have might have noticed whatever little bit uh, small class I've conducted. I have tried to explain each and everything conceptually. And in a way that everyone can understand. Uh, but obviously from next week onwards, the duration of the class will increase definitely. Because we need to revise the entire advanced financial management within 14 to 15 classes. So obviously the time period will increase. But I would request, please try to complete the lectures as soon as possible and second, it is highly recommendable whenever I'm going to conduct the class, live revision class, please do attend the live revision classes. Sometimes it becomes difficult for the student because of the job and other things. But if you can somehow manage to take out the time for the live revision classes, to be very honest, these live revision classes, they are difference. They are going to make the difference. And I, I, I mentioned earlier as well, that I am I take these live revision classes religiously. So you will see the difference from next class onwards, the time period, each and everything will increase. When do we write the cost? See, when are you going to write the cost of capital test is very simple. If you have completed, if you have completed the topic cost of capital, okay? Along with that, I would say also complete the topic investment appraisal. Then you can ask the admin, please share the test with me. On each topic, test is available on each topic. Uh, but as far as I remember, the test on cost of capital and investment appraisal is, I think it is together. Otherwise, if you have completed the topic cost of capital, you can ask the admin. They will really help you. So after completion of each topic, just write in your WhatsApp group that I need the test on this topic. They will share the test. And when you have attempted the test, you can ask them to share the video lecture with you on that test. The admin is going to share the video lecture with you as well on that test. There are all together, I think 10 to 11 tests. And on each and every topic, you we have test. Don't worry at all. We, we do not just have test. We also have a proper video lecture on that question. So I hope that everyone has enjoyed today's class.
I just wanted to give you a little bit of flavor of live revision classes uh, from next onwards. What is the next topic? Obviously, cost of capital we have not completed. It's just a little bit introduction of cost of capital. There's so many things are left. So obviously, the next class is going to be on cost of capital. There's no doubt about it. So please, you people should not be worried about these things. I think with the message, topic will be mentioned. Right now, you people, please focus only on one thing. Try to complete your pre-recorded lectures. So thank you very much for today's class. And I would request, please do attend these live revision sessions. Do attend, please. Thank you very much.